series of trucks. And, um, and I'm a bit of a, I'm a sort of a, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't have a lot of emotion when it comes to that sort of thing. But I was overwhelmed with emotion when I just thought, far out, this is really full on. Like, people are really struggling and suffering. And uh, so we need to really be in prayer for those who we don't know, but praying for them in the spirit that they would uh, experience the peace that the Lord Jesus brings. So let's pray now. Father God, just want to thank you and praise you that you have given us eternal hope. We have that joy. We have that peace. We are able to rely on you with calm hearts, knowing that you live within us. We pray for those in this world at the moment who are struggling with the death of or the loss of loved ones. We really just pray for them. We pray that your Holy Spirit would move a mighty work in um, the hearts of those who don't know you. We pray, Lord, that you would, through this time, reach out and um, save those who are struggling at the moment. Father God, we, uh, we, we, we sort of a little bit protected here, I think, um, at the moment in Australia, and, um, but there is just death and calamity and carnage going on in the world around us that we don't know. And uh, we pray for those who are struggling right now. We ask that your peace would come upon them. Father, we think of, the, uh, of missionaries who are proclaiming your good name, your loving name to those who don't know you in the far reaches of the world. We pray for them at this time, that they are probably experiencing a, a sense of confusion and loss. We ask that your spirit would move a mighty work in their lives and their hearts as they proclaim your good news in those places that we don't hear about. I ask that you protect them from Satan's flaming arrows. Father God, we thank you and praise you that we can come together this morning Pray that uh, we would encourage each other, that we would lift each other up to love and good deeds in your mighty name and that we would leave this place knowing that we are lights of the mighty God in heaven in this world of darkness. May we be strengthened and comforted through your spirit to carry on your work in this lost world. In your name, amen. <clears throat> May the mind of Christ my Savior live in me from day to day. By his love and power controlling all
me as I seek the loss to win. And may they go get the channel sing only sing only Okay, so we're going to read from uh, Matthew 19, 1 to 12. Uh, this would be the time now for the uh, young children to head on out. And you're going to the room at the top of the stairs this morning. Okay, I'm going to read from Matthew 19, 1 to 12, and then Brother Peter's going to bring us the Lord's mighty words this morning. <clears throat> Teaching about divorce. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man any... let." not man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, Not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Brother Peter. Thank you, Brad. Good morning, everyone. And good morning to everyone at home listening in through live stream. Will you pray with me briefly as we begin? Loving Father, as we study the words of Jesus this morning, give us grace to accept all that he says and give us wisdom to know how to be graceful ourselves. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, divorce and remarriage... This is certainly a word for today and a word for all of us. We're all impacted in different ways. Perhaps you're thinking about being married and wondering what it entails. Perhaps you are married, maybe in the earlier phases and still getting used to each other and learning how to live together. Uh, perhaps you're an older married person uh, and you've been married a long time, what does your marriage signal to those near about you? I have four adult children. Jen and I have four adult children. And uh, we've been married 30 years next year. Uh, what do they see? I'm sure they're examining all the ins and outs. Uh, our marriage is displayed warts and all before them every single day. Uh, perhaps you've never been married, perhaps by choice, or maybe that's not your choice. What does the Lord have to say to you? Uh, and perhaps you've been in a marriage that's failed. 
or you've been close to someone whose marriage has failed. What do we learn through the scriptures about that, about how to go forward, about restoration, about forgiveness? All these things come together in words and passages like this particular one that we'll look at today. And overarching all of those relationships and issues is our good shepherd. All of this needs to be framed and referenced through the context of Jesus and what he says to us. So let's keep that in mind. We're looking at chapter 19 in Matthew. We've been in chapter 18 for the last few weeks. And this block of teaching, 18 through 20, is dealing with relationships within the community of God, being a covenant community together. What are the things we need to know about living with each other? So we've had some teaching on having a childlike faith, of keeping yourself and others from sin, about searching after those who stray and exercising discipline over those who continue to sin. And last week we had an excellent illustration on the critical importance of forgiveness. So today we arrive at Jesus' teaching on one of the most critical, if not the most critical, human relationships of all. This part of chapter 19, the first half, deals with marriage generally, but more specifically, divorce and remarriage. And we're going to see um, that in all of the aspects of this teaching, it's God's design that is paramount. We need to have that as our fundamental stepping stone off, off, off which all the other teaching is based. We see that Jesus states clearly that marriage is designed by God, witnessed by him, governed by him. And so we then discover significant implications for all of us as we seek to live our lives, that husbands and wives need to know, that society needs to know, that the church needs to know in assessing the importance of marriage. So why is Jesus talking about this? Let's look quickly at the background context. We see in verse 3, some Pharisees come to him to test him by asking a question. Pharisees, the religious rulers of the day, they hated Jesus because he called them out for what they were, hypocrites, and those who abused their position of leadership over the people. Asking him a question was a common tactic to try and trip him up, get him to say something incriminating that they might arrest him and perhaps get him killed off. So straight away we know that it's a loaded question. What's it about? They said, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason. Okay, so why a question on divorce? Perhaps a couple of reasons. The Jewish tradition held marriage in very high regard, but their practice was nothing like that. Divorce was very common, not unlike today. Nothing at all for a man to divorce his wife and marry somebody else. And the reasons given could be the most serious down to the downright trivial as we'll see in a moment. And the Pharisees might be hoping that he speaks out on divorce and says something unpopular, makes the people reject him uh, because the crowds have been swarming all over him. Perhaps that's their motive. A second reason relates to where this encounter took place. It says it took place on, in the region of Judea on the other side of the Jordan. This is a place otherwise known as Perea. It was governed by a ruler called Herod Antipas, you might recall when we looked at Matthew chapter 14, the story of Herod beheading John the Baptist because John had criticised Herod for his Ill illegitimate marriage to his brother's wife. And so as a result, Herod had John beheaded. Perhaps the Pharisees' motive is for Jesus to say something similarly provocative and that Jesus might have the same fate as John. Whatever it is, their question, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason, is a targeted and structured question, very deliberately. The reason for that is it pits one Jewish school of teaching directly against another. There was division in the Pharisees about this. What made a divorce legitimate? There were two main schools of thought based on the teachings of two prominent rabbis. 
Both schools agreed that divorce was permitted on the grounds of indecency. Now that word comes out of Deuteronomy and we'll look quickly at that in a moment. But the dispute was what does indecent mean? What's the context? And those who followed the teachings of a rabbi called Shammai held a very strict view that divorce could only happen in the event of gross indecency, some form of sexual misconduct, but not necessarily adultery. A different group, the school of Hillel, took a much looser view. They said that indecency included a whole range of unacceptable behaviours, even trivial offences. For example, a wife burning a husband's dinner or a wife talking with a man in the street or saying something unkind about her in-laws. One rabbi even said that if you found another woman who was better looking than your own wife, that was sufficient grounds for divorce. So with that degree of cynicism, no wonder they're, 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 you, know, you, you, you just can't help but roll your eyes at that degree of careless, lax cynicism. So from the question, we presume that Jesus might take either a, a conservative view or perhaps a more liberal view in his answer, but he doesn't do either. He doesn't answer their question directly. He ignores the premise of it. And he takes them back to the creation account in Genesis. So in verses 4 and 5, haven't you read, he says, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So we see from these verses that Jesus takes it to a higher authority. He goes right back to the point of creation and effectively says, your debate is not with me, it is with God. This is anchored in the whole creation account of male and female. God created marriage, Jesus in effect, saying he made us in his image as both male and female and designed that both would live together in a covenant of marriage. This relationship would wonderfully provide for physical and spiritual and emotional union. And so in this way, God prescribes that there is no other legitimate pattern for sexual union particularly. Rules out adulterous relationships, fornication prior to marriage. It rules out homosexual so-called same-sex marriage that is not valid in God's design and God's economy. The word united is referencing glue, the idea of being stuck together. So if you bond, our, craft, our craftsmen, carpenters here, bond two pieces of timber together with strong glue, they are stuck. The bond is stronger even than the natural timbers and the concept is for life. That's why we get the idea of one flesh coming together physically, spiritually, emotionally in the relationship. Jesus then spells out, makes clearer the implications of this in verse 6. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. And therefore what God has joined together, let no one separate. Jesus is laying down a fundamental principle here. There is no place for divorce in God's ideal design. Marriage is a lifelong covenant between a husband and a wife. Therefore, no valid place for either the man or the woman or any other party to break that relationship that God has brought together. Jesus says what God has joined. Who's the most important presence in a wedding? We know the bride is the beautiful one and gets all the photos, justifiably. But it's not the bride, and it's not the groom. And it's not the pastor or the, the celebrant, it's not the parents, it's not the witnesses. It is God who acts at that moment to join together. At that point of that wonderful union, it is God who has brought them together and ordains that combination of people. And then God goes on to govern and to witness 
to that marriage. We see in Malachi, the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. Every day, God is watching when you're in your marriage. So, Jesus completely ignores their premise, takes it to a higher level. Now, what do they do to respond? We presume that they might have expected an answer, perhaps anticipating something like that. They'd come back with a follow-up question. And the basis of it is an Old Testament passage that refers to divorce. There aren't too many references directly teaching-wise to divorce in the Old Testament. So why then, verse 7, they ask, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? Well, our first reaction might be, well, did Moses really say that? Well, let's have a look. Let's go to Deuteronomy. It's the uh, fifth book of the Old Testament, and it's in verse chapter 24. We just The first few verses there give us a little bit of teaching that give us some indication of what uh, the situation regarding divorce was like in these times. Mo- this is Moses writing, verse 1 of chapter 24 of Deuteronomy. If a man marries a woman who becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her, there's that word, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, and if after she leaves his house she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house, or if he dies, then her first husband, who divorced her, is not allowed to marry her again after she has been defiled. That would be detestable in the eyes of the Lord. Do not bring sin upon the land. The Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. So we see this is the Old Testament law written by Moses. And a certificate of divorce was a fairly elaborately worded document that formally dissolved the marriage. It was written by the man and given to the woman. By the way, it almost never happened the other way. Women had next to no rights in regards to this sort of thing. So did Moses command that you must give your wife a certificate of divorce? Well, the answer is no, he did not. It's quite clear from the passage that they've misinterpreted the law and taken the phrase out of context. The actual meaning of the section is to prevent a couple splitting up, marrying others and then coming back together and marrying again. God says that is a detestable thing in his eyes. That's what it refers to. It's a passing reference to the certificate of divorce. It's an acknowledgement that it was happening and that's what they did. It was their practice. It's really... Uh, a pattern of society that Moses is reflecting. It does not mean that divorce was recommended, let alone commanded by God. So they've taken the phrase out of context and Jesus is very quick to point that out to them. Let's duck back to Matthew 19. He says, verse 8, that it was a permission only. Moses permitted you to divorce your wives Because your hearts were hard. It was a permission only, not a commandment. God laid the foundation for marriage at the beginning and there is no place for divorce in that design. Jesus said that the permission was given because their hearts were hard. People don't want to submit to God's standards, do we? In all respects, not just this particular realm of life. We are sinful and hard in our hearts and we stray. But it is God who acts with grace in bringing us back. Like that sheep who strayed that we looked at a few weeks ago. Jesus the Saviour went out, found him and brought him back. He tells them straight what the reality is. I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another woman, commits adultery. So this statement is quite strong. It answers the Pharisees' question quite emphatically. There's no place for divorce in the marriage relationship that God designed. He does not issue certificates of divorce. He does not command it. It's just not an option that is there in what God put together. So where divorce does exist, it's a decision taken by men and women. It's not part of God's ideal. 
And Jesus now introduces the concept of remarriage. Divorce in these days was almost exclusively for the purpose of remarriage. You got the idea that somebody else would be better to live with, so I'll seek to facilitate the destruction of my existing marriage for a second purpose, to go and live with somebody else. But Jesus himself now defines that a divorce followed by a second marriage makes that man or that woman an adulterer. With one exception. Jesus does say that divorce, then remarriage, is adultery, except for instances of sexual immorality. Now, this is a restatement of his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. You might recall that he addressed it there. He said there, It has been said that anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. This is Matthew chapter 5. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her the victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. So he's laid it fairly clear in respect of the Sermon on the Mount and he repeats it here now. When it comes to understanding exactly what is meant here, we do come up against a number of differing opinions about the precise words and phrases that are used, mainly related to the definition of sexual immorality. Some of the issues are, does sexual immorality relate to adultery, so having sexual relations with someone outside your marriage, or does it refer to some other form of sexual misconduct that falls short of adultery itself? Does the phrase sexual immorality apply to a regular marriage between a husband and a wife, or some other arrangement For example, the engagement period prior to marriage or a marriage between two people which is in effect a case of incest as was common back then. So therefore not really a proper marriage anyway. What's the application to the relationship? The corresponding accounts in Mark and Luke don't refer to an exception. So has Matthew got it wrong? Does the exception apply only to the action of divorce but not remarriage and therefore Jesus is saying you can't remarry? Or does the exception apply to both divorce and then remarriage such that an innocent partner is free to remarry? So there are these complexities around the interpretation of the verse with a lot of different views and We don't have the time to go into all of those today. We'd need a six-part lecture series on all of the ins and outs to understand it fully and the different interpretations. But it seems that the solid majority of commentators hold the view that the exception in Matthew is legitimate. It's not particularly referenced in the other accounts because it was well understood and it was commonly agreed. And that sexual immorality, the phrase, likely refers to a wide range of sexual misconduct, inappropriate activity. So if this is the case, then Jesus is agreeing with Moses, permitting people to divorce, albeit it's not God's ideal, but tightening up when that permission applies, i.e. for sexual misdemeanours only, not for anything else, not for the excuses that the Pharisees were using, not like a no-fault divorce type of provision. So now, at this point, the disciples enter the discussion. They sound a bit surprised, perhaps even a bit cynical. In verse 10, we read, The disciples said, If this is the situation between a husband and wife, well, it's better not to marry, frankly. It seems that they've heard what he said and decided that if there's not a straightforward way to leave your marriage... It just might not be worth getting into in the first place. Now, remember the prevailing view of the day was that divorce was always there as an option. If things don't go right, I can easily get out of it. That was the prevailing view. But Jesus presenting them with a tighter, harder, more conservative line presents a challenge to their worldview, and they struggle to accept it, as many would today who aren't Christians. 
Jesus responds with a view that affirms both marriage and non-marriage, the choice not to marry, in verses 11 and 12. He says, Not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it has been given. He describes a situation, three different types, where people don't marry. For, those, for there are eunuchs who were born that way, physical um, limitations. There are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs that way by some form of human intervention, typically castration uh, at an early age for dedication to some purpose. And there are those who choose to live like eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. So denying themselves marriage, sexual activity, to devote their lives fully to the Lord. Jesus says... If you can accept this, then you should accept it. For some, this is a choice given by the Lord and they can accept it. Jesus says, if that is what you are called to do, then good. Now, this, is, of course, is not everyone's circumstance. In fact, most can't and don't accept that way of life. And as Paul, the Apostle Paul, states very explicitly in 1 Corinthians 7, it is better for someone to marry rather than to burn with passion, referring to the physical drive. So we have this layer of teaching now where Jesus has come back and he's refuted the false angles that the Pharisees were taking and he's stated clearly again what the creation account says and therefore what he, as the Son of God, prescribes regarding God's ideal for marriage. Now... We need to take from this a number of pastoral implications when we think about our lives today. We know that there is a complexity about human relationships that drives all manner of outcomes. This is the key principle as Jesus lays it down. But we then need to grapple day to day, life by life, person by person, with the implications of marriages going well or marriages in trouble. So let's look, as we move towards our finish, about a few pastoral aspects and principles that we should think about as we respond to this particular teaching. I've got five of them. Firstly and most critically, marriage is a picture of the relationship between Jesus and his church. Now, right through the Old Testament, we see God using the idea of marriage as an illustration of his relationship to the Israelites. He talks about the Israelites being more faithful or less faithful, coming towards him, leaving him, being unfaithful, being like a prostitute. The language is quite harsh. But all the way through the Old Testament, we see that image given. In the New Testament, Paul takes it a step further and makes it very, very explicit. The marriage relationship is a picture, an illustration of the relationship between Christ and his church. I'll read it briefly in Ephesians chapter 5. It'd be well known to many of us, but perhaps you haven't heard this in this context before. Okay, so he says, Ephesians 5 verse 21, talking to husbands and wives, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's the overarching instruction. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. He quotes straight out of Genesis again. 
and the two will become one flesh. Here's the clincher. This is a profound mystery because I am talking about Christ and the church. God designed marriage to showcase the relationship between Jesus and the church. And Jesus sacrificed and submitted himself to death, ultimately for the church. And the church is then called to submit to him. On that cross, he paid a penalty for your sin and for mine, such that we can be forgiven if we repent and be restored to him. His sacrifice for the church is reflected in marriage. So submission, therefore, verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, is the only option available to us if we hold that view, if we live in a covenant community and support that teaching. Uh, I liked what Ben put in the email this morning. I didn't know it was coming, but it said this, a uh, quote from John Piper, covenant keeping in marriage glorifies Christ. And the blood that he shed to possess a bride forever. We cannot even conceive of a greater significance of marriage than the one God has given it. That's how important marriage is in God's sight. So let us keep that in mind when we think about entering marriage, when we're in marriage, when our marriage is struggling, all these things let us see that God is watching and observing and so are the people around us because it is an emblem, a model, a picture of Christ and the church. Number two, marriage is a good thing. Yeah, I can uh, testify to that. It's a gift, it's a blessing. Uh, Marriage, when lived as God designed it, is a wonderful thing. There is the opportunity for companionship, for the nurture of children, for growing together through life and modelling Christ to each other. It has God's blessing and Jesus affirms the goodness of marriage. And so we should uphold it. We should not marry lightly, never be flippant about it, particularly for a young person giving consideration to it. It is a solemn commitment that you make for life. There should never be any sense of an exit strategy. I know in this world we get all kinds of twisted permutations about it. That's not for the covenant community of Christians. If you're part of this community, that's the view you have to take, that this is for life and it's a solemn vow. We don't do it lightly. But neither should we be like the disciples with their cynicism, saying it's all too hard, most marriages fail, it's only a bit of paper, what do I need all that for? No. We should joyously enter it in the expectation that God will use us to build up our marriage partner and to have a life, however long he gives you, of joy and fulfilment and growth together in Christ. Marriage is a good thing. Number three, marriages take effort for them to work. Let's not think this is just a casual interaction where we just get along and just go side by side through life come what may. Marriages need work. It is no accident that Matthew has placed this account straight after that significant teaching on forgiveness. Marriage is a crucible. There is no context in any human relationship that is going to test each other's capacities like marriage. And so the need for grace, the need for forgiveness is common and frequent. What better way to learn how to be forgiving or how to be graceful than to marry someone who is sinful (laughs) and has all manner of imperfections and ultimately is not compatible with us. We talk about, well, I'm compatible, we're going to marry. In a spiritual sense, no one's compatible with anyone else because we're all selfish, right? And so if we're marrying someone who needs to be reminded of that selfishness and I need to be reminded of that selfishness and when I fail, it's very, very obvious, then that's the best way for my spouse to learn grace, to learn forgiveness by giving it, yeah? By watching the example of Christ. So it takes effort to work. Number four, 
Divorce and remarriage are not unforgivable sins. We know that God offers forgiveness to those who repent of their sin and stop doing it. And we've all sinned. We all continue to do that. Whilst I've never been divorced, I have certainly sinned in my marriage. On far too many occasions, I've been selfish, manipulative, I've spoken harshly, I haven't submitted to my wife, as as we're mutually called to do. According to the standards that Jesus laid down, on occasions I've been a murderer and an adulterer. I have not modelled godly behaviour to my wife every day of our married life. And yet I know that through repentance and confession of sin, the Lord forgives me. And the same is true for every single person here today. That that option is there. And we must think then about those who have gone through the pain and loss of divorce. No one on their wedding day is contemplating divorce. For any number of reasons, marriages break down. And the sin of one party, or the other, or both, is never far away. But against that, I can just picture the face of our loving Good Shepherd, just coming close in comfort and forgiveness for those whose hearts are racked with pain from the trauma something lost so far be it from me or any of us sinners to judge others just read Romans 2 verse 1 let us rather be compassionate and show godly wisdom in these situations remember all this teaching links back to living together as God's covenant community there there is an abundance of good that God can still do in people's lives. And lastly, divorce and remarriage need loving and focused pastoral care. Uh, In this passage, Jesus has confirmed God's ideal for marriage. He states the principle that there are no grounds for divorce and remarriage except on the basis of sexual immorality. But he stops short, though, of addressing the wide range of complex situations that people find themselves in. What about cases where only one spouse is a believer? Perhaps they've been married before either came to the Lord. What happens if one... What do you do with the marriage? What about situations involving abuse? Physical abuse financial abuse, emotional abuse, what about neglect, terrible scenarios. Human relationships are complex and marriage problems can take on all forms. The Apostle Paul addresses some of these in 1 Corinthians 7. That was a church that had all manner of strange living situations going on regular marriage down to slaves who are just put together by slave masters for the purposes of procreation to produce another body the 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 suite of scenarios was broad so he's addressing that complexity the lord has laid down the guideline but he's then addressing the working out of that and that's the type of scenario that we find ourselves in in this day and age paul says for example If a non-believing spouse wishes to leave the marriage, then the believing spouse is not bound to continue with it. So there's a practical prescription from him. But there are many other scenarios that aren't addressed directly in the scriptures. This is why God gives us pastors and elders to help us work through these situations. Divorce should never be seen 
as an easy way out of a difficult marriage. Restoration should always be the goal. Uh, these are real moments, real times to learn and show forgiveness and understanding. The difficulties should, difficulties should be worked at intensely through reasoning grappling with Bible texts and prayer and tears and pleadings to avoid the divorce at all costs. I think as Brad said before, well, it was a very powerful statement that he made about the criticality of building the marriage up at all costs. And there should be careful, wise counsel given about remarriage in the light of what Jesus has said. Any new marriage should be built on the solid foundation of biblical teachings with Jesus right at the centre. So there is much more to say than we have time for today, but let us always come back to Jesus being at the centre. He's the centre of our lives as individuals, but he's particularly in the centre of our marriages and that's how we ought to view a prospective marriage or a current marriage or a marriage that's in difficulty. We need to surrender and submit to him as we do in our daily lives. Let's pray together as we close. Our loving Father, we thank you for your wisdom in creation in designing male and female for marriage. Thank you that marriage is a picture of the love that Jesus has for his church. We pray for the marriages in this church, that you will protect and strengthen them. We pray for wisdom for husbands and wives, to recognise their weaknesses and vulnerabilities, and to work together before you to grow in holiness. We pray, Father, for those who have experienced the trauma of divorce either directly or indirectly, perhaps as part of the family. We ask for your loving comfort to be with them and that you guide them in their future steps. Give them wisdom and grace to know how to surrender and submit to your will. Father, we recognise our sin and the fact that we all fail you. We confess this to you. We thank you for the forgiveness that comes to all who surrender their lives to you through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. And it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Oh, thank you, Peter, for those mighty words and instructions from the most beautiful words of God, our Holy Bible. Okay, so um, thank you.